Welcome to Factorio Masterclass. My name is Neil Outs, and this is the series of tutorials and guides here on YouTube covering all aspects of the game and aims to provide insights and resources to help you improve. This is the second part of our three-part tutorial on circuit networks. If you have not watched the first one, which is the basics of how it actually works, the circuit network, then I highly recommend you start off by taking a look at that. There should be a link in the description and probably somewhere on the screen as well. This is the second episode where we'll be looking at practical applications that I commonly use. These are the simple applications and we'll save the more advanced setups for the third episode and further on. Each of these episodes usually starts as inspiration for my streaming over on Twitch. This is at twitch.tv slash Nilaus and you're very welcome to drop by. I'm streaming six days a week and at least three of those are Factorio, that's Tuesday, Thursdays and Sundays and it's 8 p.m. Central European time. It would be really cool if you drop by. It's uh, very fun to have people drop, dropping in and uh, saying hi. And if you have ideas and comments and feedback, like uh, what to do in upcoming episodes, that kind of thing, then leave a comment below or join the Discord server or uh, let me know in, in uh, the live stream over on Twitch. Let's dive into the design. Here we are in the first example that I want to showcase. This is all about how to monitor your coal consumption in a power plant setup. So you have in this, let's say, start to early game, you have a setup where you're building your, your steam turbines and you have coal coming in and uh, you'd really like to know if you continuously have coal coming in. So the first thing I want to do is we, we're creating this setup and uh, I'm going to manipulate a bit with the setup to say, to show that uh, the case. But the thing is, we what we want to do is that uh, I want to be told if this is running out of materials. How do we tell if this is running out? Well, I think I say the simplest thing is since it all flows down here, and the last tile here, if I monitor the last tile, I go like that, and then I have to change this from enable to read and hold. Then I will get it up here. I will get a measure of eight. Now this one drops below a certain value. We can, for example, get it out here to an indicator. I'm going to take the volume away because we don't want that. I want it to be, I don't know if, I don't think I need this one. Uh, show alert. And I want to have the condition that when coal, because that's what I'm feeding in here, is less than four then it's less than half empty because we still want to be able to have this one pick up two and that one pick up two at the same time. That means there's going to be four left. So if it's less than less than that, then then uh, if less than four, then it means that the, the belt was not full when it took away from the belt. So uh, that is, I'm going to use it as steam engine indicator and then say call for steam is low. And this will give us an indicator if this one runs out. So now we need to simulate a way that that happens. <laughs> I guess we can just uh, check this one out and uh, just skirt all the way down here until I think actually it's easier just to do this. And we're going to look for a warning at this point. Oh, you have to check this one out. And now we see here we have five. They will just pick up one whenever they can. And uh, as this, this will usually happen when you have a coal mine feeding your steam engines. And by the time you start up there, we have a warning. Coal for steam engine is low. Very, very simple setup. You have a monitor with hold, not even able to disable, just read. And then transport it over, saying when it's less than four. This will happen usually when you have a coal mine feeding in here and you scale up more and when you the power, it's only going to consume coal according to how much power it's actually needing. So when you need 20%, then it's only going to be consuming 20% of what you have on the belt. And as your power increases in the base and your coal mine gets weaker, then at some point you're going to over consume what, what you can feed in here. And in that case, it's very, very convenient to have a warning up here saying, hey, you're actually running out. 
And here we are with the second example. This is also related to power management. So we're going to stay around here. So I'm trying to replicate a sort of early game situation. So the early mid game, you have some solar power and you have some steam engines. And this is one of the things that I know a lot of people will be stumbling across. It's uh, like you have your solar power here and you have your steam engine here. And you would like to have in the nighttime, all the accumulator charge is available. But yet, we don't use the stored power in the accumulators. We are instead using steam engines. So you really want to be able to, in the nighttime, to use, use the accumulator charge and let that burn down and only use the steam engine as backup power in case your batteries run out or accumulators run out. And that's, that's problematic. So what I want to do is uh, we will have to do this by setting up an accumulator. Accumulators have this weird and very, very convenient trick is that when they are synchronized with the rest of them, so either they all go to zero or they all go to 100, they all synchronize and from there on, they will always go up and down together. So now that this one is 100% charged, it will be synchronized with the rest. What I want to do is um, some people would limit the input on the belt, but that takes a long time until it reacts and then probably daytime again. Some might be you tempted to interact with the inserters, but they still have a buffer here. So they, I mean, they have lots of buffers. They have, they have coal and then they have the steam buffer you can see over on the right hand side. It has 200 steam and this one also has 200 steam. Now steam is actually going to be burned off quite fast. So it's much easier to manipulate this pumps and that will much faster have an impact on stopping the production. We are going to take the accumulator and monitor that. That I know this is the one thing I forgot in my uh, previous a walkthrough of all the entities. This is a very important entity to be able to monitor. The monitor you get out of it, you can set it to whatever output signal you have, but it defaults as A, A being 100%. So that is the percentage load of the, all the accumulators, specifically this one, but when they're all synchronized, they will all go up and down at the same time. So we can use this and we can use it by getting that signal from here into the pumps and then using a condition here saying, what if when A, the percentage load is less than 50? Copy, paste, and I'm gonna take the same signal all the way on the red wire here and go into these two as well and power them up as well. So let's look at the network here. Obviously during the daytime, we are now in the daytime and uh, they switch off because there's nothing to do in the daytime. They will still have a lot of steam stored, so they'll still burn through the steam and they have some water, but these have a red indicator. You can see there, the right little red dot. That means they have been turned off and they are not pumping. Uh, they would be pumping because there is not enough, not a full belt here. So what I want to do is I want to speed this up so that we can see what's happening. And I'm going to just set it up to 10 times speed. And then I'm going to be ready to set it down again. So we are going to power through the night where solar panel will cover all of our needs. And then we should see that as it starts, first it'll burn through the steam that's stored in the steam engines, but then the steam engines will shut off. So there'll be a small spike of the orange here, the steam engines, but then that will fall down. There should be a stall spike. Let's go down to speed one and we can see what's happening. And there, it's gone to one minute. This was what was stored in the steam, but then it switches off and now it goes to accumulator power because these ones don't have anything. The accumulation here, you can see the value is decreasing 75. And it should hopefully, if we've done our calculations correctly, it should be running out. So this will go up and consume all the power. And when it's then goes down to about four gigajoules of energy, then all of the power will switch on, but this is where something unfortunate happens. Whoa, look at that. They all switched on. And what happened was that what is happening now is that they all switch on and you will probably see that the accumulator accumulators will be starting to be filled up. Let's see. Suddenly you get a big spike of steam engines filling up here and that will be stable at this point. It's actually at a point where it doesn't fill up the Accumulator charts. It's kind of unfortunate. Yep, there we go. That's exactly what I wanted to show. I wanted to show here. What happens is the steam engines fill up and then they uh, they work at 100%. They will 
take care of the base needs, and then they'll start filling up accumulator charts. As soon as the accumulator charts hits 50%, then the steam engines will shut off, the, the accumulators will take over, and it will then fluctuate like this. And that's, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but it looks awful on a graph here. And it means that your things are flickering. There are two ways to fix it. One is through an SR latch, which is a bit too advanced for me to show right now, but there is a very much, very easy way to do this. And uh, I'll do the other one in the other branch. So this one will switch on at 60. This one will be done at 50. This will switch on at 40. And this one will switch on at 30. That is a super simple way to fix it. That means that sometimes, yep, you'll have this road working and if needed, the next one will switch on and the next one and the next one. That means instead of having the whole power plant switch on and off, then you switch off each pump at different intervals. And what you can then see here, well, at this point, uh, only one of them is online and that one will be switched off as we now go back into the full solar panel. And I can then speed up again because I'd like to see one more cycle going through. And you can see the accumulator charts gets filled up by so solar alone. And then why, by the time we get to the nighttime, this is where we get. Uh, first, this fall down when when now the solar power is working at 100% and then filling out the battery charts, then there's no longer where you get 100 and the rest of the power is just wasted. And we will now go into here where we can see, I'll just power this down so we can see what's going on. Now the chart here is Dipping when it leads to 60%, one steam column is switching on. And the next one, as this one gets close to 50, this steam column will switch on. And it'll continue continue to switch on more columns as it um, as it needs to. There might be still some some flickering, but generally we will get a lot less flickering because it'll be just at this point it'll take care of it. And this, the, the accumulators, accumulators will now very slowly slow, slow down here. And then you can see another row switched on. This one switched on because it got below 40 to 40%. And we might see the last one also switch on, or we might see it actually not switch on. It's going to be really close. I think this one has stabilized. And what we'll see now is that the, as the solar power increases, we will also start putting stuff back into the power, back into the accumulators. And as we reach a certain threshold, boom, we switch off some of the steam. So now the, the steam is, uh, is, is switching off much more gradual, one column at a time. And I think that's a very convenient way of doing it. And you don't need to do any more advanced logic. And uh, before anyone mentions that SR latch is in chat, I know it's coming in the next one, but not here. So this is a super simple way of managing your power. And we can move on to the next example. And here we are with the third example, which is going to be showing a few uh, few combinations, reading from uh, boxes and controlling inputs to things. So when we have a rocket silo like this one, it is super easy to automate it. You just hit that button and then uh, make sure that your base can feed it and then it'll start launching rockets. However, if you continue to do that, you will eventually launch too many rockets. Rockets are kind of expensive. And in my opinion, at least, you don't want to just continuously launch them unless the base can keep up. But you want to balance the launching of it so that it only launches in the speed by which your science is being consumed. And uh, there are two reasons for that. One of is don't raise resources. The other thing is, in here, there is a buffer where you when you launch it, there will be science here. And if this science cannot be output hypothetically because this belt is full, this box is full, but if you don't have a box, then you can put it on a belt or something. But if you don't do it, then next rocket launch will delete all of the science you've already crafted. And that is horrible. So uh, don't want to be losing science like that. And uh, the way you do that is by, I do it is by monitoring some output boxes here. So we will be taking a red belt, a red circuit here. I'm going to take it from one box to the next box and in here. So right now I can monitor that it's 2.2. Now I want to say that I don't want to launch anything unless there's less than 2000, right? So I put it into this inserter that takes care of the insert in here. That one should be here. 
this one will now have an insert that says only insert when it's less than 2,000, 200, no, 2,000, for example. And you can see this one is red. If I take this one out, I'll put it, no, okay, I can't put it in there, but I can put it into my inventory. And I should be able to hit this one. Yep, nothing happens at this point. So right now we have automated it, but it is in a stable condition. Now, if I want to change it and say, you know what, I actually want to launch more. I want to launch 3,000 have at least 3,000 in my outboxes here, then it will immediately send one in. I can put that one in here. And we are launching a rocket. What you'll then be seeing is in here. Come on, drag it to the side. Boom, it creates the 1,000 signs and that need to be exported. So if I could not export it because the for whatever reason, these boxes were full. I didn't have any boxes there. It could load two rockets, but then it would delete it from there on. So you can see now that it's just filling up for the next one. And at this point, let's see, uh, we want to see that this one is now getting a signal of 3,200 as everything has been exported. And it's no longer, it is now also red, so it doesn't put anything in when it reaches the 100%. It's gonna take a bit of time to get the 100%. But we'll uh, gladly wait. We can even just speed it up here, just to make sure that it goes faster. There. Now we have to see that it is not putting anything in here. It is ready for launch, and it's standing there. The animation is done, nothing happens. If we now have our science, let's simulate that we have some science consumption up here by simply put, taking it out and putting it into some boxes. That will simulate that we have some, some science going. And we will now see here, as this one uh, gradually goes down to 3.1, and it goes to 3 very soon. It should be outputting like 13, 8, uh, 12 each time. And it's down to 3,000. And as soon as it goes below 3,000, it will launch a rocket. And that's a really simple way to control basically anything. There we go, it launched. And basically anything, you monitor on the box, and you control the inserter. It doesn't have to be as advanced as this. It can simply be, don't insert here unless there's less than 100. I'm going to walk away because it's very noisy and then move into our next setup. And here we are in a different base, but looking at uh, a different setup. This is utilizing the fact that we can hook up the robot port to the network. As mentioned in the previous uh, tutorial, then I have two options for how to do it. You can either read the logistics network or you can read the robot statistics. In this case, we're reading robot statistics and I am going to find that one so we can also see the robot statistics. You can see here the total number of, hmm, what was it? T is the construction bots. Okay, so the total number of construction bots is 7,000 exactly. And the total number of uh, logistics bots is 3.1. I have set them some conditions here that make sure that I feed all the materials in, like green plus robot frames, red and robot frames in here and they will try to insert into this one up until there is a certain condition met. For example, I want this to be 3000 logistics robots and I want this to be 7000 construction robots. So if I, for whatever reason, decided that I wanted 8000 construction bots in my network, it would simply start building it. What you should be mindful of is of course it can only build 350, but um, if you're gonna build it, then it's probably because you're gonna need it and therefore it will eventually be emptied as they get all allocated to other designs. Probably not do it for 7,000, but let's say 7,200, just because then we can actually see that it gets done soon. And we can look at the value here. We have the T is still only 7,000, but we are increasing the number of construction robots crafted here. That should be pretty good. And that's a really, really simple way to manage and to control how many robots you want in the network. I have a, I have an affinity for having like even numbers and they go like, I have 3000 of these and 5,000 of those. But of course you can also do it more generic. I don't think I'd re generally recommend it, but you can do it basically saying that when the available robots is less than 200 or less than 100, meaning that when every single robot is, ad is allocated or already sent in things. However, the reason why I'm, I'm 
kind of advocating against it is because at some point you will always be in a situation where you can can allocate all robots. For example, you are cleaning out a forest or putting down solar panels, then suddenly you will have issue 10,000 commands. Well, you will, even if you have 10,000 robots, they will take a while to get out there. And we can already see it, uh, it changed here and that one. For example, I can also just take more of these and that's a very, very simple way of controlling the number of robots you put in. Uh, in my masterclass design, I have my yellow science, which is also what where I make my robot frames. And that's a really convenient way to extend it and then make that into our, our robot build. But that's a different topic altogether. And this is another setup that I would like to go through in just how to use pumps to control the splitting of materials in the oil refinery this is super important if you don't know how to do this you are probably not going to be or you're probably going to hate building oil because it'll always jam either because it runs out of something or because it uh, the pipes are full of one of the other materials so you definitely need to do this this is a quite an advanced one from my master previous master class but the idea is the same uh, basically it it has some priority this one has been set up and i'll just walk through how it works and then we can look at the circuit networks the priority is that first and foremost all heavy oil will be converted into petroleum up to a certain limit then any excess beyond that will be converted into light oil or heavy oil cracking so that the heavy oil will be cracked onto light oil then we will have a light oil filling up up to a certain amount when that certain amount has been reached, then uh, we will continue to to work on the on the light oil cracking so that we convert more to petroleum and then we'll consume it. Because petroleum will be the most heavily used, I want that to be sort of the lower end of the priority so that we make sure that we get enough lubricant and enough light oil and then everything else gets converted into petroleum. And the way we're going to do this is we are going to monitor the input here, the content of these two tanks for lubricant. And you can see it on here. There's 10,000 lubricant and the 10,000 lubricant goes into this pump. And that one simply says, don't pump any more lubricant in here until when we have 10,000. What that means is that these lubricant pipes fill up and they just jam up here. Now I'm also taking the lubricant measure up on this red wire and converting it into this pump, which is then controlling the flow from these two over into more uh, to the light heavy oil cracking. This one says, when you have at least 5,000, you can start cracking some of it. And then it moves on and starts the light oil cracking. The light oil cracking up here, we have a monitor on these. It goes into the yellow belt, but I have not actually constrained it. Uh, I draw more accurately, I have unconstrained it recently. Here, let's say if it'll only do that pump when it's less than 20,000 because I don't want more than 20,000 in here. Currently I have 49,000, so that's too much. I can easily just ditch some of it and then uh, we'll get closer. Once it has equalized, boom, now it'll start pumping again. And what that what happens is that you can see, you'll see more stuff flowing in here. What I also have is an additional one. Uh, this is the output here from the light oil cracking. So you can do this both on the input side and on the output side. Either way, this one will monitor the flow here and say, if you have more than 5,000 light oil in your tank, that's why I have these tanks up here. If there are more than 5,000 in the tank, then you are allowed to take the light oil cracking and put it into the petroleum, convert it into petroleum. If this one shuts off, then these will stop converting and the more, all the light oil will then be directed up here to fill up. I can actually just do that by doing that one and that one. That should be, wow, that's, it's almost impossible to make it run out. It goes up so quickly with this one, boom. And then it starts up again. So it's it's not really possible for me to actually make it run up. Well, I can, I can try it, I can do like that. Now this one will be shut off because I don't have any light oil. And this one is shut off. That means this one is shut off. But very soon, we'll see that we have more than 5,000 light oil because it is producing a lot of light oil. And that's basically how you can control the flow between different ones, basically prioritizing 
lubricant, then prioritizing light oil, and then have everything else sort of being uh, cracked from heavy to light, and then we have it as petroleum. And because under the assumption that I'm probably going to use more petroleum than anything else because of plastic and sulfuric acid. So that's a, a really neat way of, of doing this one. Before going into the last bit of uh, the, the circuit controlled stations, then I'd just like to take a moment to thank the patrons who are supporting the channel. Without you, it would not be possible for me to continue to deliver the content that I do and make the videos that you see here on the channel. It is basically the cornerstone of uh, how this whole thing runs. So thank you very much to the patrons who choose to support the work I do here. There's of course no obligation, but if you choose, then uh, there is a link in the description below and probably somewhere on the screen as well with uh, the link to the Patreon. Thank you very much for supporting. Let's take a look at the train station. Because the train station, as I explained in the initial one, can be enabled disabled. And I really like the way that you enable it by some kind of condition. That's really simple, a green, a green light. This one is not enabled. And you can see it because the name will be in red. Now I changed the name to include icons. I bet I'm going to get a ton of questions about that. <sighs> well, I'll put it into some other video. And but the red, the icon will be red. And when it's red, it's disabled. When it's enabled, it'll have a light green one. So the way I do this, and what this means is that I have stations here. This one is called uh, basically an assembler, which is like the main base and an arrow in and then iron in and I have another iron in here and I have another iron in here. So when the iron comes, oh, that one switches on. Great, let's run down there and take a look at it. And oh, look how fast the trains are. They are coming in immediately. So what we see here, we see that it's coming in and the way I'm done, I've done this, I have hooked up all of the boxes into one network on the red network that is right here. And that's now it says 24,000. I have set a marker here that says if it's less than, if anything, everything is less than 20,000, then it is, it's going to send a green signal. And this everything, it's getting a bit more advanced. I want to go a bit more into detail with it in my next tutorial. But basically it means that it's, it takes everything, all the signals coming in and evaluate it together. In this case, it's either going to be iron or copper that comes in. And it's instead of make, forcing me to actually change it to an iron signal or a copper signal for each one and then forgetting it and then all hell breaks loose, then I put a generic signal that says just whatever comes in, if it's less than 20,000, then send a green signal. And the only thing that comes in on this signal is a an iron signal. So that should be... Uh, be quite limited. Now we have also, they have uh, two more things for this. It'll send out green signal. I put this into a lamp because I think it's a nice little cool thing to display a lamp with a light when it's, when it's turned on. Then I also take it over here. I convert everything, that, anything that comes in, each of the stuff that comes in, it's still only going to be one, uh, multiplied by one. The pole point of this one is simply to translate my green signal here back into a cop, uh, an iron signal and I'm highlighting that I'm putting into the global network. The reason why I'm doing that, this is uh, I have red and green wires on all my city blocks. That's just how I do things because that means by looking at this, I can see the total demand of my entire base at a glance. Each number here represents one train load that is requested. And it's pretty damn simple. And I'm pretty sure that the stone one is incorrectly set up and that's why uh, it is uh, lighting up, which is gonna be an excellent opportunity in the context of a tutorial to make sure that we actually figure out why it is set up so incorrectly or check that it is actually true. And we're gonna go down here, this one. It's get a feed in here. And the reason why it's feeding in here is because it's 3,900 in storage. That's not much. And that is perfectly correct that this one is enabled and therefore is requesting. And now it's requesting both iron and copper as well into this network. So as uh, you can see, that's uh, super simple. And the way that it works over here is that when they are all empty, some trains will come in, they'll do a loop around, but uh, this is something that will be better in the next version of Factory 1.1. But this one is enabled 
you can see here, and there should be a train coming in soon enough. They will tend to come in since they come in from the south. They will tend to come in and fill up the lower ones first. But very very quickly afterwards, they will go in and and fill up. And that's the basically how you do it. If you have multiple stations with the same name, you can control the opening and closing them so that you make sure that the trains sort of even out among, uh, among the stations. Very, very simple way of doing it. Have the same name, disable them when they have enough, and then the trains will find a way to go to the other ones. Of course, if you have too many trains, too much coming in, it can cause congestion. But that's more on a train than on a circuit uh, tutorial. We're going to look at that. So that's um, pretty much uh, pretty much it for this tutorial. I hope that you uh, you found it useful. This was very much focused on specific examples that I commonly use, and I have also specifically decided not to go into more of the advanced ones because. We will save that for later. So I'm kind of gradually walking you into the wondrous world of circuit networks. And uh, they, it also means that at this point, these the things that I have shown here are the ones that I use in pretty much all my bases. And with that, you can do pretty much anything. Uh, if you want to be more advanced, you can, but it is certainly not necessary uh, to get built big advanced bases. And this is so funny. There's clearly a problem with this one. It's our that's something we'll do deal with in a, in a future episode, I'm sure. So thank you. This is from my Twitch base. So uh, if you want to see what's going on and why this mess is here, then uh, head on over to Twitch. I'm streaming this base Tuesday, Thursdays, and Sundays at Twitch TV slash Nilos, and you're very welcome to drop by. Also, of course, if you are finding these tutorials useful, then hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more content like this here on the channel. Also hope that you will be checking out the Discord server with tons of people talking Factorio and other games as well. It's also a good way to keep up with my schedule and my changing whims of what games and when and what and schedules and all that stuff. I'll uh, put all that on Discord. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And as always, stay effective.